Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. So my name is Edith, as I was represented, and uh, we will talk to you right now today about reducing the operational complexity of a service mesh. So again, I'm Edith Levine. I'm the founder and CEO of Solo. Yuval, you want to turn? Yeah, I'm Yuval Kuhavi. I'm the chief architect at Solo.io. Yeah. So, and, and honestly, let's just dive into the te technology, I guess. that That's why we are all here. So, so let's one second kind of like step back service, which is a really, really important piece of the infrastructure and something that a lot of people are familiar with today, but let's kind of like take a step back and just verify that everybody is understanding what is service management, what is his job, and then we'll talk about the future of it. So in the nutshell, it's very simple. You have two services, service A and service B. And before service match, it was very simple. You know, a request will go to service A, from service A to service B, and it's basically this will flow. Now, before service mesh, what we were doing in order to make that direction and all this operational code, we basically in our microservices, we put two things. We put basically the business logic of the microservices itself and the application, but we also needed to embed it some operational code, like a code that may be responsible for logging and the code that responsible for, uh, you know, uh, pieces like, uh, like uh, security or, or, or routing or anything like that, that will be inside the microservices, which means that every time that you want, for instance, to upgrade your business, your, your operational code, you wanted to change the configuration that basically how the application is flowing, how it's being secure, how it's being observed. In that point, you actually also need to redeploy your business, your business application. It's basically going together. That was the couple. It means that when you deploy one, you deploy the other. When you upgrade one, you upgrade the other. And basically, the idea with service mesh was to abstract that, right? Basically, let the microservices on everything that related to the business logic of your application and have next to it something that will be responsible for the operational code. And this something is basically a proxy. So that's basically the idea of how we, this is implementation detail of what the service mesh can bring. So as I said, it was focusing on four things when it's actually started. And honestly, <laughs> the, the PM people who did the work on the service mesh nailed it from the beginning. This is the problem that people try to attack. And that's exactly what service mesh was, was, uh, was taking on. The first one is everything that related to the application level routing, right? Uh, two microservices communicate to each other. The second thing is everything that related to observability. Now you have a lot of little pieces of microservices and a lot of replica of them. So it's not very clear when the request is coming to. So how do you collect the log? How do you understand what's going on? How the application is flying, right? The, the, the third one is anything that related to res resiliency. So stuff that related to retry, fault injection, timeout all of this. And the last one is everything that related to zero trust security, everything that related to MTLS, to encryptions of the application when it's going on the wire. So that's basically what service mesh is taking. And the way it's actually working, again, and I'm just, I know it's very basic and I'm sorry, but <laughs> to level set, is basically there is the proxy, which is basically a cycle to the service. You're putting it on the same pod and basically we are um, and basically tricking the IP table to make sure that every traffic in and out from that microservices will go through that proxy sidecar. Okay, now you're doing it everywhere and you have a lot of sidecar and a lot of microservices, but the thing is that those proxy, who is usually Envoy proxy, are extremely powerful. They can do a lot of stuff, but also they are not really smart. You need to tell them what to do. And that exactly is the response of the control plane. So the proxy, it's what's called the data plane. This is like the traffic is going through that. When the request is coming, it's only going to the data plane. The control plane is not involved whatsoever. But in order to the, the, the data, the data plane, the proxy, you know what to do when a request is coming to you, is getting that configuration for basically what's called the control plane. And if you guys know, for instance, in SDO, it's SDO. And it's basically collecting the data, watching your environment, taking the configuration from the user, watching your secret. And then every time that something changed, one of those configuration changed, one of those environment changed, one of the microservices went down and up. So basically, we'll take it, it will translate, it basically will create a snapshot to the end of the proxy. 
and give it away. So basically in that case, all the proxy know what to do when the request is coming. There is no data plan involved whatsoever when the request is coming. Okay, so that's really, really trivial. So again, how it's worked kind of like when you're flying the, the, the request, when a request wanna go from up one to up five in that case, the R is basically the request. It's fair, it's going to go to the first sidecar, right? It will do some, you know, translations and everything that you need to do. It's going to go to the other sidecar on the destination, and it's going to go to the microservice, the other microservices. So that's basically how it's working. Now, with this model, there's potential some problem. Now, every service mesh that you know about today, this is how it's working. This is something that running in production. We have hundreds of customers, they're all running it very successfully in production. But there's also some challenges, and that's some challenges that we're helping our customer to overcome with, and there is a lot of work of uh, work around. But honestly, in the nutshell, the, the challenge that exists is around overhead of cost, operational complexity, and performance. So I will go a little bit, give you some example and glimpse of some of the problem. So for instance, if we're talking about operational complexity, let's say that, first of all, when you're deploying the mesh, you need to redeploy all your application in order to inject, in, inject the sidecar. If you want to upgrade, let's say that you have, for instance, a CV and you wanted to have a CV on Android and you want to upgrade you know, the application, or basically we have to redeploy the sidecar. But what happened in that case is that you know, you will deploy the application R1, for instance, is up. Let's just assuming that is MySQL, right? In that case, it will try to basically connect to the outside world. When it will fail, it will crash. Because sometimes the sidecar is taking a little bit of time until it's actually up. And sometimes the application could be up before the sidecar itself. And when it will wake up, it will try to connect. If we will not be able to do this, sometimes it will crash. It's not happening in every application, but it could be in some. And that's very problematic because then you're creating kind of like the you know crushing loop and we need to somehow overcome it. So again, you have a CV, this is something that you definitely need to fix, right? You have to redeploy the application. That's not a simple thing. It's a, it's a challenge problem. And specifically because your application is owned by other team, usually the application team, and you are the, maybe the, the, the platform owner, and how is that being coordinated? Again, it's a CV. You really need to fix it as soon as possible, right? So that's the first one. The second example of a problem is that let's say that you're running a job. So in Kubernetes, this is something that people is doing easily. The only thing is that next to your job, now you will have a site. When the job will finish, the site part is not going to finish. It will there, stay there, which means that your pod is not going to be deleted. So you can find yourself with a lot of pod flying there in your infrastructure with basically just a sidecar and doing nothing. So that's another problem that potentially can happen. The third one is everything related, relatively to latency. If you're looking right now, you know, the measurement that we did internally, if you're looking at two microservices that are trying to talk, they're talking directly with no service mesh. It's around two milliseconds latency. If you're looking at with sidecar, we measure something more like five milliseconds. So again, there is a latency that it's adding. You're getting a lot of benefit from service mesh, right? I want to be very, very clear here. But you also think, you know, it will cost you some. And talking about cost, of course, putting Cypher next to every microservices that you have in your infrastructure, that is very expensive, right? Okay, so we kind of like thought about it together. I will tell the story. It's very actually an uh, interesting story. We in Solo were working on it for a long time, probably over a year. Um, we basically did some, you know, I was talking in STLCon about, you know, can we get rid of the sidecar? Uh, we blogged uh, some uh, architecture optionals of how something like that is going to happen. And while we were doing it, um, you know, I met, I met with Louis Ryan, the founder of, uh, of Google, uh, of STL in Google. And basically we, he asked me, are you doing what I think you do? And I said, yes. And he said, and I said to him, are you doing what I think you're doing? He said, yes. And we decided together, we basically understood in that point that we are parallel to it. Solo and Google working basically on the same implementation. So we decided to basically join forces. And we last Wednesday basically announced, we're calling it MBN Mesh. Now, it's not a new mesh, it's STL. It's a mod inside STL, which is very important to understand. Sidecar is still part of STL, right? It's not going anywhere, but this is another mode that we're basically offering that we call MBN mode. And the idea with this again 
is basically to reduce the cost, to simplify the operation and improve the performance. That's basically the target that we put ourselves. Okay, so let's understand how it's working. So basically there is no sidecar anymore. We get rid of the sidecar. The sidecar is what causing this like dependency or you know, the awareness of the application to the, to the mesh. We don't want, that. what we actually want is the, the service mesh will be transparent to the application. Usually it's not only given by the same team. So it's very important to kind of like make sure that it's not coupled. Um, what we're doing is we're actually putting a proxy here right now. It's called Z tunnel or zero trust tunnel. And it's one per node. And basically the responsibility is extremely simple. When the requests want to fly, if the only thing that you are interested in is MDLS and and, and basically everything that related to zero to us, and honestly, a lot of our customers are. Basically, it will be very simple. It will fly first to the layer four proxy. The layer four proxy in that case is, can do some policy in layer four policy, can give you some metrics on layer four, and it's doing MTLS and encryption. It's basically created a tunnel. We're using HBone and basically go all the way to the destination a Z tunnel, and then it will go to the application itself. So basically, again, what is important here is that there is no sidecar. Everything that we're doing here, though, on that proxy, it's only layer four. We are using HBone in order to do that. And it's very important that, you know, you're getting all those zero trust encryption and everything that you need, but, but there is no sidecar. There's one per node. Now, this is working fantastic if all you want is layer four. Layer four is basically, there's not a lot of complex stuff that you're doing there. It's basically relatively simple. And we feeling very, very comfortable about it being shared by the node. What we not feeling need to be shared by the node is everything that's related to layer seven. And we believe that layer seven should not be um, a multi-tenancy. It's a very dangerous uh, a concept. And the reason is, because honestly, there is a the, the, the noisy neighbor problem, right? I mean, in layer seven, you potentially can run some WASM, right? You can do some very complex pieces that go into an external service. That's taking more time. And when you're running it as a as you know, as one share per multi-tenancy, that's a dangerous thing to do. Because it's mean that you know there's the noisy neighbor, there is some application that potentially will uh, suffer from their neighbors taking more resources. So what we did, we created a concept of waypoint, we're calling it. And waypoint is basically layer seven proxy that can live everywhere. It's really, you know, it's really your decision where it's live. We can tell you in solo that we have some ideas and we are, we're doing some tooling in order to help people to decide where to run it. But in the natural, it can run outside the node, it can run in the node, it's very dependent on you. And what we're doing, we're basically taking those layer seven proxy and we basically have one deployment per this a service account destination, which means that it's not shared. It's basically one specific for a service account. And what we did also in the STL community, we basically try to move as much as functionality as we can from the client side to the service side. That way that we will not need to, right? And basically what will happen in that case is very simple you will still need to go to layer four proxy and create everything related to security and you know, encryption. Then if there is a layer seven request, again, not a lot of the time it's not going to happen. It will go to the layer seven proxy. It will do whatever I need, you know, timeout, sleep, whatever you want it to do. And then it will go to the layer four proxy and directly to the application. So that's basically the idea of how we separate those layers. Now, the beautiful of it is that honestly, when we have a lot of people who are adopting service mesh, what we see is that they first usually, a lot of them only want the zero trust. So honestly, this is a very easy model to actually adopt that. And then incrementally, they want to add more and more feature. So this is a very nicely way to do this. Another thing that we noticed, which is very important, look, we're working with ST, with Envoy from the beginning, even before we work with STO, so over five years, and we went and looked at all the history of the CVs that happened in Envoy. And what we discovered is that there were all, all lifetime of Estia, there were two CVE that happening in layer four. 
But every other CV is happening where the complex things happen, which is layer seven. That way, by even taking it out of the node, maybe seriously detach it, it's giving you a lot of opportunity because that way you don't need to upgrade the proxy so often on the node that we're in charge of the zero trust. So that's kind of like very high level on NVM. Now, what is the advantage of there? It's pretty simple, right? First of all, we get rid of all the sidecar. That's by itself, it's a huge cost saving, um, right? This is basically another picture that's showing the same thing. So in so we actually did a, a blog that actually trying to calculate. We, we did an open source project that basically, you know, uh, showing, <laughs> You know how you know what is the difference between deployed that way? You know the the sidecar model versus uh, versus uh, uh, MBN in some uh, in some uh, in some cases that we try, and we saw a huge improvement in terms of what is how much you need to cost per per, per uh, resources. So again, recommend you to go and uh, and read it. But again, the idea is that it's extremely uh, saving your resources and cost money. The other thing that is very, very interesting, and this is only a very high level illustration of this. I just wanted to make a point, and hopefully I will successfully doing this. I What I did is like, look, layer four usually, it's very simple and very quick. Usually it's almost sub-zero. So I put here as a, you know, as kind of like measurement as 0.5 millisecond kind of like latency. When you're looking at layer seven, of course, it depends what you're doing, but kind of like let's do the average is around two millisecond. So what I wanted to show here is that if you're not using any mesh, of course, you're not using any latency. doesn't matter, right? There's no proxy, there's no latency. If you're using the regular sidecar model, layer four, you will have two layer four proxy in the client and the, the, the source and the destination. Therefore, it will be a two layer four. It's around one millisecond. If you're looking at MBN, it's exactly the same thing because you have two layer four, it doesn't matter. It's exactly the same thing. It will be the same time. If you're looking at the regular sidecar model for layer seven, you will have two layer seven, right? So that would be around four, million, four millisecond. But if you're looking at MBN, we basically trick. We took one of the layer seven for two of the layer four. It's still faster. So what we so we expect it to be around three milliseconds. We have some measurement that we will be able to share it with you soon. So in the natural, even in terms of performance, we should see, even though there is another hope, we should expect to see some uh, reduction. And the last one, which is in my opinion, the most important thing in MB, and I will say it again and again, working with hundreds of customers with a different environment, I'm telling you, operation I, is not that easy. And it's extremely important to make it simpler. So what we're doing right now, and Val will show us a demo very soon, it's very simple. You're applying your mesh, the application is running there for years. You don't need to redeploy it, you don't care about it, it's all great. Then you apply the policy that you're interested. Again, it's just going to be forced. When you don't want it, remove the, the, the mesh, everything is continuing running. You really do not need to do anything with this which I think is extremely, extremely powerful. So I think that the best way, instead of me talking about it, I will let you all show it, and then we'll come back to me and, and, and talk a little bit about more about the future. Hey, Yuval, I'm putting, moving it to you. Thank you, Did. Let me share my screen here. So you should be able to see my screen here. I have a Kubernetes environment running locally on Kine. And you can see that I have a bunch of uh, applications, a sleep application and a hello applications that, and a hello application that we use in this demo. Uh, so first thing first, let's just kind of see that everything's working as expected and we'll make a call from the hello, uh, to the hello application from the sleep application. So this is just exiting to the sleep and you can see that I get like hello v2, hello v1, a bunch of them. It's load balancing between the two applications I have here. All right, so, so far there's no it's here installed. Um, the pods are running, you can see they're 47 minutes old. Uh, let's uh, install it here in ambient mode to get the demo started. All right, so we run this command, it's here install and we set the profile to ambient. And let's actually change to see all namespaces. And you can see 
ETCD is installed and the Z tunnels are installed. And as you did mention, it's one per node. And in this kind setup, I have three nodes. So I have three Z tunnels and you can see that they are installed on different nodes, right? So uh, the Z tunnel is the L4 component that's installed one per node, all right. So far, everything installed and traffic still working. Right now, nothing is going through the mesh. Everything is still as normal. The mesh is still installed. It's not it applied. To apply it, we set a label on the namespace to it's very similar to how it's your works today. And I think that's kind of a theme with MB and we try to keep everything very, very similar to the how it's your works today. Um, so that it, we're not trying to kind of make you learn new things, right? So we have a label that we apply. It's slightly different. We declared default namespace to be part of the uh, ETCO mesh in ambient mode. All right. Now, when we apply this label, uh, you can see that the calls are still working. Uh, but how do you know then it's going through the Z tunnel, right? So let's look at the logs for the Z tunnel. And let me just X out of here. I'll open the logs for the Z tunnel. Clear this out and make a few more calls. All right. And you can see that uh, we started getting HBone traffic, which is uh, the traffic that's encapsulated with HTTP connect. Uh, going through the Z tunnel and you can see it's for the port of the pod and um, pretty much as expected. Now this is uh, showing only one node. That's why you don't see all the calls here because only one of the hello worlds will show up here because the other one is on a different node. Um, now let's say uh, it's going through the Z tunnel. That's great. Now let's see uh, if we can see what's, what's inside it. So let's open up. Uh, term shark on that node. So let me give it root permissions. Here we go. Okay, now let's make some more calls. All right, perfect. And you can see there's a bunch of noise here, but you can see that the packets going to the node are TLS encrypted. They have transport layer security. Right, so you can see that everything is going through the Z tunnel. Everything is being transparently encrypted with MTLS. Okay, one sec. And I just want to show the pods. And uh, of course, the demo guts made the TMAX stuck. I'll just kill that terminal and start another one. Sorry about that. If we'll open K9S, you can see that the pod, they're still, you know, 51 minutes old. Nothing has changed in the pods themselves, right? So everything's looking great. The traffic is now transparently flowing uh, through the mesh. We didn't have to restart anything. We didn't have to, you know, there's still one other one container. There's no sidecar added. Everything is kind of ambient. The mesh is in the background and traffic is just flowing transparently uh, through it. So uh, we, let's talk a little bit about layer seven. We just seen kind of the layer four level. Uh, let's see a demo with layer seven. Oh, sorry, VS code just crashed. <laughs> Let me reopen it, apologies. Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about layer seven. Let me just see the to the folder. And let me show you what I will be applying. So first thing we'll talk about the resource for the waypoint proxy. And uh, as you can see, we use the um, new Kubernetes gateway API. And this is how we, tell Itzio that we want to create an L7 um, waypoint proxy for a workload, right? So we can tell that to Itzio that we want for the hello world uh, service account to create a gateway for it. So let's apply this resource. 
All right, perfect. So now if we look at the pods, we can see this new waypoint proxy that was just created. Perfect. Now, how can we know that it's actually working, right? So for that, let's look at this virtual service we have here. And we can add a delay with Itzio um, to kind of demonstrate that the policy does indeed apply, right? So let's apply this virtual service. All right, so now we have virtual service created. The traffic will flow from the zip tunnel to the waypoint proxy, to the second zip tunnel, to the service. And now if we repeat our curl, this time I'll just add a time command. Sorry, here we go. You can see that it takes a little bit longer and should take around five seconds. In our case, 5.2 seconds, obviously to account for the latency of the proxies themselves. So you can see that indeed our uh, virtual service did apply to the waypoint proxy and that the traffic did flow from the Z tunnel to the waypoint. The waypoint applied kind of the fault injection and, uh, and send it to the uh, hello world. And we can see the response from the hello world after the five seconds delay. Uh, now, uh, everything's working good. Uh, Let's, let's say now we're done with the demo. Let's get rid of the mesh. We basically do the steps in reverse. We remove Itzio. Uh, sorry, I need to apply this. Yeah, there we go. Remove everything. All right, and you can see this will basically bring our mesh to the start, right? We can still make calls, right? So traffic transparently moved into the mesh. And then when we remove the mesh, everything was restored to normal. And you know now there is no mesh and traffic is just flowing directly uh, between the two pods. Right, and the application, the microservices are still running, right? You remove the mesh, they're still running, they're still old. There is nothing basically that, that changed, right? Basically go back. About an hour old, uh, still yeah. ready, still one container. There's no sidecar, everything exactly. working as before. The waypoint was removed, the waypoint proxy. So it's kind of all back to step zero uh, when I started the demo. Mm -hmm. So again, that should take dramatically the operation down. And the reason it is, is because now you don't need to, call, every time that you need to do something before that you needed to go to the application team, tell them, hey, I need to restart, I need to upgrade. And there is a lot of communication between people. I think that basically is bringing you control and operational become extremely, extremely simple. So that basically was, honestly, if you ask me, this is the strength of, of, uh, of Waypoint. And I'll just mention that the waypoint proxy is just a regular deployment. It can be scaled up, scaled down. You can do a rolling upgrade. It's not coupled to the application lifecycle. Exactly. So in terms of, and again, we will have more questions and you will talk way more on the, on, the, on the implementation details, but in the nutshell, this is kind of like I would just summarize basically what the MBN bringing to STO. Again, it's a mod. You know, the sidecar is right now not going anywhere. This is the default, um, a, you know, implementation is the sidecar. What we're hoping, working with a lot of people from the community and from the industry, that we will be able to bring MBN to production in the next six months to a year. If we will do that, then I believe that we in solo believe that MBN will be the default mode for going forward for STL. So in terms of what the advantage, as I said, is reducing costs. Uh, right, drastically, because you basically have less proxy running there, less API calls, less, all of this is basic, all the operational calls is basically going away because you have less proxy to communicate to the to a STLD and so on. In terms of simplifies the operation, I think the demo and talk by itself, it just really, really become easier. Again, specifically what we see a lot of the stuff that related to CVEs and so on become extremely simpler. Everything that related to, to improve performance and of course, and the most important thing is, and I think it's really, really important, is the security have to be equivalent, right? We can't kind of like play with security. Security is why service mesh is now the first goal on service mesh. And therefore the security should be equivalent 
and with all those benefits coming on top of it. So that's kind of like it. Um, I would just say where we think that stuff is going, where we wanted to look at it. Right now, the way it's working is that if we're looking at, sorry, what just happened? Yeah. If you're looking at specifically at the Z tunnel, you will discover that it's basically right now is an anyway based proxy. There's a good question if it's have to be. Uh, there is some implementation details there that uh, right now we'll need to fix in, to, to fix in, stem, in terms of, uh, of scaling because the way Envoy is working. Um, but there is a lot of advantage of using something that we know and love. Uh, but because we weren't sure if it's overkill or not, what we basically did, we created an interface. We basically created a, make that component an MBN swappable. Basically, butter included in that right now they are Envoy, but the idea of basically you can swap it with your own implementation. Um, so we personally believe that there is a few interesting stuff. Like for instance, we can potentially remove it with eBPF. Again, it's a problem because how do you do H boy in, in eBPF? It's a great question. But we think that eBPF definitely can play a big game here is already. So the way today we are redirecting the data from those application microservices, one of this is called the Tubal Road, to basically the sidecar is using IP table. Um, we think that with eBPF it would be way simpler. So that's something that honestly you are just wrapping up right now and we're contributing it to the community right after. Uh, but the, we think that there is a lot of advantage that we can get by eBPF to enable basically the mesh. And that, again, that's, that's something that is top in mind for us. So, um, I mean, I will finish by just saying, and I will let, I, hopefully people will ask questions. We can also elaborate more. I will want you to answer way more technical question. But my point is that we're just putting it out there. Uh, it's STO, right? It's a modern STO. There's getting started. There's a lot of blog that explaining why and how in more detail than what I did here. Um, a, there, there's a video of the demo. A, we in Seoul really care about education. So what we did is we basically uh, created an instruct free uh, ends on training. So you can basically go and take it. It's free. You don't need to pay anything. Just go play with this. It will make your life easier to play with this. And in the end, you can even do a certification test. And if so, you're getting a certification uh, just to show that you know what it is and what it's working. This is the, doing the fundamental, but in the future, we will do something more advanced. Um, again, we put blogs like around what it's doing to the wallet. You will see coming from us a lot of other blogs that basically educate you know, how, why, how does it work with VM? How does it work with Knative? How does it work with you know, uh, with zero trust and so on. So again, stay tuned. We, 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 it's very important to us to educate. Um, and yeah, and, and as I said, this is an open source project. Psycho is not going anywhere anytime soon, uh, but we are starting working with our customers to work on MBN. Uh, we believe we can get it to perform to, to uh, production relatively fast. Um, and there is also a mod that you basically can decide at what's running with Psycho and what is not. Like you can basically write it one next to each other in the same cluster potentially, um, and basically decide what you you know what you're using. Um, I would kind of like yeah uh, yeah. So this is kind of like in the natural again. There will be a lot of education to do here. We would love you to try that, and we would love to get feedback. But it's also an open source community, right? It's part of STO. so we would love you to come and join and you know and help us to make it better. And and there's already companies that jump like Reddit and uh, and Wired. Cloud. So again, love, love, love your help to make it better. But we really believe that this is a, a better model. And I think that it will make all our lives and adoption of service mesh in generally way easier. So yeah, that's what I have. I don't know if you want to add something. Uh, yeah, we try to make it, you know, incremental. Like you said, you can use sidecars and gradually uh, introduce MBN by this uh, namespace labels and familiar. You know, it's virtual service is still the same, policies look similar. So we really want to make it easy to, to test it out, to get started, to start, you know, small and kind of grow over time. And we're really looking forward for your feedback. Fantastic. 
So I think that if we have nothing else to add, we can answer question because I see there is some question in the in the Q and A. You what do you want us to take it? Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think the sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Yeah. So the first question is around how to ensure redundancy on the Zin uh, tunnel agent on the Kubernetes worker node. Right. So the way I look at the at the Z tunnel, I look at it as part of your data path, right? In a sense, it's like asking how do we ensure redundancy of Linux, uh, right? In a in a more traditional setup. Uh, now, the, the way we ensure that is make sure it's reliable. The way we ensure it's reliable is, a, you know, in general, the more code you have, the more bugs you have. So we scope down what it does. And the Z-Tunnel only does layer four, and it provides, you know, identity and encryption. So it's very well defined, a relatively low amount of code, so there's less chances of bag, bugs. And obviously it, it runs with Kubernetes, so we can do all the traditional, you know, microphone is critical, make sure it, it restarts and all that, but the key here is to really increase its reliability, you know, by reducing the scope and by making it mature. And, and you know, Linux 20 years ago crashed a lot and now it doesn't crash so much. Um, so it's just a matter of making it more mature and making it, you know, well, kind of well tested, well used, and with a small scope, you won't have a lot of bugs. And that kind of ties into a different question I see. Is there any specific reason why Envoy is not inherently multi-tenant? So it's it's not a, anything to do with Envoy, right? But in general, the more code you have, the more bugs you have. Uh, the layer seven, the application space is always evolving. There's new protocols, there's new uh, ways to do security. Uh, so there's, there's a lot, a lot of logic that goes into layer seven that just doesn't go into layer four. Uh, so that's why we're more reluctant to create a multi-tenant uh, Envoy environment, right? And think when you take it to the next level with WebAssembly extensions, for example, uh, you know, a poorly written WebAssembly extension can kind of take down all of Envoy. So it's not something that you want on your base layer component, you know, on your Zeta component that sits on every node and responsible for all your traffic. Right. If you have a proxy that your team owns, you can have your extensions there because their impact is just you. Um, so it's nothing specific about Envoy. It's more the separation between, you know, traffic layer four flow and L and layer seven flow, where layer seven is a lot more complex. Fantastic. Uh, the other question that I see here is around service entry and how it will work. I, I will just say that uh, so that we are writing blog on it right now, exactly. So we'll be able to give more data. Uh, what do you wanna, I don't know if you have something to add to it. Yeah, not much to add, but we plan to make all the existing ETSIO features to work. Service entry is a bit complex. It's a little bit trickier. Uh, uh, like I did said, it's gonna be a blog. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, is there any architecture changes with STL control plane in MBN STL mesh versus the trans uh, traditional one. So there is no two. I mean, I was just saying there is no two control plane. It's one control plane, right? It's just a different mode. But you, maybe you can say now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if you're a bit uh, familiar with ETO, ETO already today has two different modes, right? You can have a sidecar, you can have a gateway. So this is an, another additional mode where it's ambient, right? So it's a din change, it's a same ETOD, same way you deploy it. We just added more uh, to the ETOD so it can handle ambient. Yeah, but very important is that, again, it's STO, <laughs> it's just a mode. There's nothing different. This is how you can actually run sidecar model next to an MBN on the same cluster with no problem because STO for him is just another mode. It's not a big deal. Um, does this have some other, uh, <laughs> with Cilium service mesh, would you be able to comment on this? I, mean, I think both of us definitely can comment on this. You want to start? Yeah, sure. So Cilium service mesh, um, let's start with Cilium kind of layer seven approach is to have a single layer seven proxy per node. 
Uh, we already mentioned why we're kind of against it. it. It has reliability, cost attribution issues, uh, noisy neighbor issues. So we're not big supporters of that. They did mention that they plan to address that, but that hasn't happened yet. And you know, when they'll address it, we'll, we'll respond accordingly about what we think about it then. I just don't want to kind of yeah. guess what's going to happen. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, go ahead. No, I will add one more thing that is very important. We really, really important to do a separation between, you know, vision, which is extremely important to what CIUM service mesh is today. There's a huge, huge gap and it's important to understand it. The vision is what you guys all know because it's being very well marketed. Evan said that the implementation of Cilium Service Mesh right now is only an ingress implementation. And I think it's very important to mention that. It's not doing a lot. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not really integrated with STO in any form shape besides some forking of it. There is a lot gap between what there is really there and what it can run right now in production versus what's not. I will say that when I'm looking at, uh, you know, Personally, my customers and our users, I will say that our customer really likes Service Mesh. They feel like that it's really, really good. In, you know, they're excited about using it. They want a mature one. It took us a lot of time to build one that everybody can use in production. And our customers are not very interesting of waiting five years to have Cilium Service Mesh mature. And right now it's very, very far from the abilities security and the maturity that SDO have. Yeah, I mean. All right, let's see. Where can we see it on call and latest EBBF efforts? Okay, so currently it's on my laptop. Uh, <laughs> and once it's ready, I will make it PR against the public ETSIO repository. So just, you know, be on the lookout for those uh, in the in the ETSIO public repo. Okay, I suppose that there is the same control plan, then can run and, and manage, oh, wait, maybe I'm ready to run. Yeah, um, yeah so, uh, you want to read it? The question, uh, I believe the question is, given that it's the same control plan, can we manage both ambient and the traditional ETSIO? And the answer is yes, you can, you can have both, you can have both on the same cluster. Uh, we really want to enable incre incremental adoption. Yes, and that's also important for for um, for um, upgrade, right? Or move between one to to each other. So let's say that you right now all your infrastructure is in sidecar, but you're interested in starting adopting MB, and maybe you don't want all your cluster to MB to start it. You want it to be great. You want to do it slowly and safely. So this is exactly why we put this feature. Uh, from the get-go, because it was important to us to support it on the get-go, that people will be able to do that. And there's a follow-up question, can their services of ambient and sidecar communicate? And the answer is yes. So ambient uh, uses a, a protocol called HCON, which is an overlay network that's HTTP based. And as part of ambient, we've added HCON support to sidecars, so they can cross-communicate. And so it's uh, you can have for example, one namespace in MBN and that namespace will communicate with the rest of your cluster, vice versa. Awesome. So hopefully, I mean, you will like it. You like it. We we'll really, really encourage you to join us, uh, the effort and the SEO community to basically make it production ready and have every feature that is missing and everything that the customer needs. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, if you have any other question, you can always ask either in the STO uh, community Slack or in solo community Slack. We also have a specific uh, channel dedicated to question around MBN. And as I said, we will put as much as resources as we can to educate it. But I really encourage you to go and uh, try the Instruct workshop. I think it will give you a good hint of how it is and also, you know, let you you know, get your hand dirty a little bit. I think it will be very, very clear after it. So love to get the feedback. I mean, me and you both born on a on the Slack of STON. So, so yeah, I'd love to get feedbacks. And if you need any help, we are here. Yeah, I'll just say after working on this project, I'm very excited to see to see it live announced. And I'm I'm really 
you know, really want to hear from the community, you know, kick the tires, kind of let us know what you think. Yeah, it was a long uh, few years of working on this. So we're actually pretty excited to see it live finally. Yeah, I think we with that, we can hand it back to the Linux Foundation to wrap things up. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you both so much for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.